Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is chapter one, which is called Dissecting the Laboring Body, Frankenstein, Political Anatomy, and the Rise of Capitalism, um, part four. And it's the last part of chapter one. The Rights of Monsters, Horror and the Split Society. It has been perceptively observed that the literature of terror is born precisely out of terror of a split society and out of the desire to heal it. The monster and the vampire, who we have come to know as Frankenstein and Dracula, had their literary births on the same night in 1816. In reply to the ghost story challenge laid down by Lord Byron at the Villa Chapuis near Geneva, John Pelladori's The Vampire and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein were simultaneously conceived. If Shelley's creation is immensely superior to Polidori's, it is in no small part because of the imaginative power with which she thematizes the problem of the split society. To be sure, Shelley's novel explores complex and enduring problems of identity, gender, self, and other. But as I shall demonstrate, it does so while framing these issues in consciously social and political terms. Notwithstanding its omission from most critical commentary, the problem of class injustice permeates Shelley's novel. Yet, as befits an aesthetic work of this order, class relations are subtly inflected in Frankenstein, refracted through the specific experiences of complex individuals. The problem of the split society acquires much of its aesthetic force in Shelley's novel due to the way she internalizes it in the psychic lives of her two principal characters, Victor Frankenstein and his creature. A split society, she warns, fractures the individual psyche, creating terrible internal tensions, even schizoid psychoses, in the human agents who compose it. Disowning a whole section of humankind hating, despising, and persecuting them, the oppressor invariably disavows an integral part of himself, and it is largely himself with which she is concerned, as we shall see, and diminishes his own humanity. Pathological hatred participates in the very monstrosity projected onto abject others. In Shelley's dialectic of monstrosity, violence and oppression rebound on the oppressors, distorting their own personalities and marring their judgment, while also creating, as Wollstonecraft had warned, an enraged underclass intent on retribution. Through this dialectic, Shelley probes the dynamics of the split society at the level of interpersonal relations. In constructing a micro microcosmics of class and gender division, she lends a personal immediacy to social questions, such as Godwin had done in Caleb Williams. As the editor of a recent edition of her works points out, believing that socio-political inequities of her day were mirrored within the individual and the family, Shelley's strategy involves coalescing the public and private and private. However, this subtle coalescence of the private and public has eluded many commentators who have privatized her literary politics, reducing Frankenstein and other of her novels to purely domestic tales. One critic insists, for instance, that while Mary Shelley retains the monster metaphor, she purges it of virtually all reference to collective movements, relocating rebellion within the family and thus shifting from politics to psyche. Yet this is to miss the politics of the psyche and the family at work in Frankenstein, as social conflicts are registered and enacted in the psychic lives of the main protagonists. Indeed, as I suggest below, it is precisely this intricate interweaving of the political and the, inter and the interpersonal that enables Shelley to map gender and class as mutually constituting modes of social exclusion and oppression. In delineating power structures, she uses the novel to map macro relations onto the microdynamics among individuals, as if to remind her readers that they are not witnessing a merely private drama at a crucial moment in the novel. The creature cautions Frankenstein 
that if his creature continues to reject and isolate him, the consequence will be an evil so great that not only you and your family, but thousands of others shall be swallowed up in the whirlwinds of its rage. Animating these claustrophobic personal relations is a great social drama, one whose effects, Shelley warns, are sure to be wide-ranging. Indeed, the novel's most or the novel's social implications are further highlighted when, as we shall see, a mass revolt of sailors averts a final calamity at this, as the story draws to a close. Structurally, too, Frankenstein is organized on collective lines, revolving around the accounts of three different narrators. Ship Captain Robert Walton, who takes Victor Frankenstein aboard his craft, Victor Frankenstein himself, and the creature. Organized as a polyphonic novel, Frankenstein destabilizes the authorial position, to use a recent jargon, taking the reader through multiple narratives, none of which is granted moral authority. As befits a dialogical novel, the ending is highly ambiguous. The reader is given enormous interpretive range as generations of radically contending reading suggest, or readings suggest. Consequently, multiple analytical frames, feminist, psychoanalytical, post-colonial Marxist, can illuminate Frankenstein. To add yet another layer, the novel also problematizes its own generation and birth, suggestively spanning a nine-month period, the time frame of a typical human pregnancy, and mapping this frame onto crucial happenings in the author's own life. Events in the novel begin in December 1796, the month in which Mary Shelley was conceived, and the book ends on September 11th, 1797 the day after the death of her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, who perished 11 days after giving birth to Frankenstein's future author. Equally suggestive, these dates correspond closely to those of Mary Shelley's own third pregnancy. So, while recounting the birth of a monster, the text also ruminates on its own birth as a novel. My hideous prodigy, as the author was to describe her book in the preface to the 1831 edition, as if to foreground the self-reflexive character of the work, of the way it narrates the story of its own writing, Walton's letters are written to his sister, Margaret Walton Seville, who just happens to bear the same initials, MWS, used by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, as the author of Frankenstein typically called herself. Quite appropriately, many critics have productively read the text in highly psychoanalytical terms, exploring perceived connections between authoring and the death of the mother. Much romantic writing manifested precisely such a heightened self-consciousness about authorship and the act of artistic production. But by situating the problem of self-authoring within the terrifying dynamics of the split society, Frankenstein takes the impulse to a higher level, imploring the dilemmas of literary production in an atomized society. This later problem, production of the self in a society rife with atomic individualism, crucially frames multiple dimensions of the text. Contrary to conservative readings, it is atomism, not science and the pursuit of knowledge, which comprises the axis of danger in the novel. What the book criticizes is not so much the pursuit of science as the dangers of intellectual, artistic and scientific production in a society fraught with possessive individualism. In such a social order, scientific investigation all too easily serves personal aggrandizement, not societal well-being. As the creature remarks upon being first warmed, then subsequently burnt by fire, how strange, I thought, that the same cause should produce such opposite effects. It is this insight, the opposite effects to which human invention can give rise in different settings, that informs the texts. Fire is, in fact, a decisive example here, given the full title of the novel, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. In the version of the Prometheus myth, most familiar, familiar to her, that prepared by her father under the pseudonym Edward Baldwin in a children's book of 1806, 
Mary Shelley would have encountered Prometheus stealing fire from the chariot of the sun in order to animate a human being he had formed out of clay. But whereas Prometheus's enterprise was successful, catastrophe ensues when Victor Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, attempts something of the same order. The problem is not science any more than it is fire. The difficulty attach, attaches to the form of social organization. Just as the novel is not anti-science, neither, contrary to another conservative reading, is it anti-Godwin. Not only did Mary Shelley dedicate the book to her father, who was so delighted with it that he published a second edition in 1823, but despite the anonymity of its author, many early 19th century readers quickly grasped its Godwinian character. The Tory Quarterly Review sneered that the book was piously dedicated to Mr. Godwin and written in the spirit of his school, while the Edinburgh Review described it as formed in the Godwinian pat pattern. The doubling of the central characters, the reversals of pursuer and pursued, the emphasis on circumstance and character formation, the distortion of all parties in an anti-democratic society, and an abiding concern for justice, all mark Frankenstein as a Godwinian text, albeit an exceptionally innovative one that, in its powerful use of Gothic elements and its remarkable self-reflection, achieves something highly original and distinctive. While Mary Shelley's novel may well have offered a commentary on aspects of her own upbringing, the death of her mother, frictions with her stepmother, disappointment over her father's opposition to her elopement with Percy Shelley, it was anything but a repudiation of Godwinism. Indeed, it is arguable that, for all its critical reflection on the father-daughter relation, the book also represented a deliberate affirmation of her father's worldview. At the same time, Frankenstein is also deeply indebted to the author's mother, whose works she was reading and rereading before and during the composition of the novel. Mary Shelley's book develops an insight to which her mother had converted Godwin. The critical role of the social sentiments and affections in the formation of both enlightened individuals and a just society. Prior to his relationship with Wollstonecraft, Godwin professed an austere intellectualism in which reason's task is to subdue and dominate the passions. In this spirit, he had treated familial relations as detracting from the individual's duties to society. But under the impact of his love for Wollstonecraft, Godwin came to appreciate her instance or her insistence that sentiment united with reason produced the strongest of social bonds. He would never relinquish this insight Indeed, in a revised edition of Political Justice, he publicly acknowledged the deficiencies of his earlier views, arguing that rather than subtracting from civic duty, happy domestic relations reinforced it. With this in mind, we can readily perceive Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as foregrounding Wollstonecraft's contribution to Godwinian liberalism. The great weakness of Victor Frankenstein is not that he thirsts for scientific knowledge, but that he pursues it in unhealthy, even dangerous isolation from social affections and interactions. It is not science the novel condemns, but individualistic enterprise attached from social obligations and responsibilities, or sorry, but individualistic individualistic enterprise detached from social obligations and responsibilities. It is telling that Victor Frankenstein's troubles originate with the death of his mother, after which he is sent to school in southern Germany. I was now alone, he writes, separated from family and friends, living in a solitary apartment. The natural sciences became, he tells us, nearly my sole occupation. As Frankenstein embarks on his experiments in creating a living being, he becomes even more isolated, in spatial as well as social terms. In a solitary chamber, or rather cell, at the top of the house, and separated from all the other apartments by a gallery and a staircase, I get my workshop of filthy creation, he intones. 
In withdrawing into his own world of self-creation, Frankenstein retreats from nature and social intercourse. My eyes were insensible to the charms of nature, and the same feelings which made me neglect the scenes around me caused me also to forget those friends who were so many miles absent. Separation from others, an inherent feature of the enclosing, separating, and privatizing tendencies of capitalist society, carries with it a dangerous social pathology. If the study to which you apply yourself has a tendency to weaken the affections, he observes, while, which, while retrospectively recounting his fate, it is not befitting the human mind. Divided from the social passions, detached from domestic relations, the mind grows deranged, and therein reside sources of great destruction. If no man allowed any pursuit whatsoever to interfere with the tranquility of his domestic affections, he observes retrospectively, humanity could avert great disasters on the scale of the colonial destruction of Mexico and Peru. Here, a crucially gendered dimension enters Shelley's analysis as she advocates breaking down the division between the ostensibly male sphere of intellectual and artistic creation and the ostensibly female domain of domestic relations. Patriarchal bourgeois society severs and partitions the two, detaching and enclosing these spheres, the prevailing system of class and gender treats all production as private activity and all products as private property to be jealously guarded from others. The value of the male individual is determined not by his contribution to communal well-being, but by his personally accumulated wealth and honor. The result is a manic drive for utter separation, enclosure, of self from others, for a form of absolute autonomy in which the individual aspires to be author of his own private world of glory. The pathology involved here is that of the self-birthing male, an individual so fanatically committed to individuation and private accumulation as to deny dependence on all others, particularly the female others responsible for his birth, nurturing and social well-being. Just as capital presents itself as capable of generating wealth on its own, thereby denying the productive powers of labor, the self-birthing male seeks to appropriate to itself the procreative powers of female bodies. And in making his creature without the involvement of another soul, Victor Frankenstein stakes just such a claim on the while obsessively separating himself from others, particularly women, systematically avoiding his fiancée and procrastinating about marriage and sex. The manic drive to separate, enclose, and isolate that Shelley portrays in Frankenstein rehearses the delight in particularization that fueled the Renaissance rage for anatomy. Moreover, anatomy and dissection figure more decisively in the novel than has often been appreciated. Victor Frankenstein informs us early on that he is both an anatomist and a grave robber. I became acquainted with the science of anatomy, he explains, and spent days and nights in vaults and charnel houses. Combining body parts stolen from corpses with others from dissected animals, he cobbles together his monstrous creation. Who shall conceive the horrors of my secret toil as I dabbled among the unhallowed damps of the grave? Or tortured the living animal to animate the lifeless clay? I collected bones from charnel houses and disturbed with profane fingers the tremendous secrets of the human frame. The dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnished many of my materials. In, align, in aligning him with the surgeons, anatomists and grave robbers reviled by the laboring poor, Shelley stamps a decidedly anti-working class identity on Frankenstein. And in the anatomist's assembly of the monster, she imaginatively constructs the process by which the working class was created. First dissected, separated from the land and their communities, then reassembled as a frightening collective entity, that grotesque conglomeration known as the proletarian mob. Like the proletariat, notes Moretti, the monster is denied a name and an individuality. Like the proletariat, he is a collective and an artificial creature. Consistent with this plebeian identity, all three figures who address the monster refer to him as a wretch, 
a common expression of class snobbery. That anatomy, dissection, and grave robbing should feature so centrally in Mary Shelley's account of the monster is not especially surprising. Anyone with even a tenuous connection to popular politics would have been aware of the widespread hostility of the poor toward anatomy, but there were more specific connections where Shelley was concerned. Barely a hundred yards from the house in which she grew up, her family could hear the shouts of the crowd at the executions that took place every few weeks at the new drop of the Old Bailey. Exposed to public executions and the tumult they provoked, it is also likely that Mary Shelley was keenly aware of the practice of grave, rob grave robbing. She was, after all, a regular visitor at St. Pancras Churchyard in London, site of her mother's grave and a haunt of resurrectionists. As someone who frequented cemeteries at a time when over a thousand corpses a year were being stolen from burial, burial grounds in England and Scotland, she could hardly have been unaware of the public outrage over grave robbing. Further, not only did she spend hundreds of hours reading at her mother's grave, but of the books she most frequently devoured there, her father's essay on sepulchres, sep sepulchres occupied a favored place. Written years after the death of Mary Wollstonecraft, that essay offers a non-religious defense of reverence for burial sites. Proceeding from principles of sense experience, Godwin justifies the special attachment we feel for the places where loved ones are buried. In my desire for an enduring connection with the deceased, he proclaims, it is impossible that I should not follow my sense or by sense the last remains of my friend and finding him nowhere above the surface of the earth should not feel an attachment to the spot where his body has been deposited. His heart must be made of impenetrable stuff who does not attribute a certain sacredness to the grave of the one he loved. And such sentiments must surely have been shared by Mary Shelley. Having never known her mother, Shelley regularly sought maternal connection at her grave. St. Pancras Churchyard became a revered site, an emotional center point of her life. She and Percy Shelley would read there to each other for hours from her mother's writings, and it was here that they first declared their mutual love. Given this enduring emotional attachment to a gravesite, Mary Shelley would almost certainly have shared the horror at grave robbing and dissection that permeated the London working class and have powerfully sympathized with the victims of the anatomists and resurrectionists. Interestingly, her last novel, Faulkner, opens with a child defending her mother's grave from a, mis from a mysterious stranger. Strikingly, the protagonist of that novel describes with disdain the anatomist's reduction of the human body to a mere collection of parts. To the surgeon's eye, human body sometimes presents itself merely as a mass of bones, muscles, and arteries. This, of course, is precisely how the human body appears both to capital and to anatomists. And it was her acute representation of this bourgeois worldview of reified body parts and beings detached from the organic holes in which they inhere that gave Frankenstein much of its resonance. Mary Shelley's working class readers would immediately have grasped the horrors alluded to by Victor Frankenstein as he describes his secret toils dabbling among the unhallowed damps of the grave. In an era which anatomy had become a flashpoint of conflict over commodification in life and death, this fictional account of proletarian bodies being stolen, dismembered, and monstrously reassembled would have carried a potent charge. It is fitting then that Shelley brought out a revised edition of her great work in 1831, the year in which the Anatomy Act gave surgeons the right to all unclaimed bodies of paupers who died in the poorhouse. As the classic fictional account of the body snatching era, Frankenstein imaginatively grasped and enacted the horrors of corporal commodification that daily haunted working class people. Consistent with this, the first illustration to accompany Frankenstein from the 1831 edition brought out by Bentley's standard novels portrays the creature awakening to consciousness amidst a collection of human and animal body parts. To the idea of an enormous body constructed from dissected human and non-human parts, 
Shelley added the crucial idea that Frankenstein's creature should be animated by electricity. This was more than mere authorial fantasy. During highly publicized experiments in the, in the 1790s, the Italian scientist Luigi Galvini had moved nerves and muscles of dead animals via electrical currents. In the next decade, Galvini's nephew, Luigi Aldini, extended such experiments to the corpses of recently executed criminals by wiring them to a large copper and zinc battery. These scientific demonstrations rehearsed the punitive class politics of anatomy. Even in death, the bodies of the poor were not free from direction, regulation, and inscription by the ruling class. Indeed, as if to flaunt the politics of class humiliation, Aldini would attach his wires to the head and anus of the plebeian corpses he reanimated. More than this, however, his experiments recast these politics in the framework of industrial capitalism. Where Rembrandt's Nicholas Tulp had mimicked proto-capitalist manufacture by applying a tool to a pauper body, Aldini mimicked the industrial factory system by attaching a mechanical power source to the criminalized body. Mary Shelley was well aware of these experiments with bodies and electricity. In the introduction to the second edition of her classic, she listed galvanism as part of the stock of ideas from which she had drawn in composing her novel. Equally significant in the context of the repression of Luddite opposition to displacement of labor by power-driven machinery, she would also have known that the relationship between proletarian bodies and industrial power was a contested one in both life and death. As if to warn the British ruling classes of the dire consequences that awaited them, should they persist in so abusing proletarian bodies and minds, Mary Shelley made Ingolstadt in southeast Germany the site of the monster's birth. Again, the significance of this would not have escaped astute readers. In his four-volume Memoirs of Jacobinism, Abbe Bar ba sorry, Baruel had identified Ingolstadt as the birthplace of a secret society, the Illuminati, a band of revolutionary conspirators deemed responsible for the French Revolution. Percy Shelley was particularly fascinated by Baruel's work, and he, Mary Shelley, and others regularly read it aloud together. A number of anti-Jacobin novels also linked Godwin to the Illuminati, and the author of Political Justice had himself chosen a site near Ingolstadt as the location of the Philosopher's Stone in his novel Saint Leon. In addressing herself to the semi-paranoid anxieties of Britain's rulers, Mary Shelley presents them with a Jacobin monster run amok, a microcosm of mass plebeian upheaval as the inevitable consequence of their system of oppression. More than this, she renders the creature's killing spree directed at Frankenstein's relatives and friends as his creator's responsibility. Indeed, as an expression of the very essence of the latter's own being. In a moment of rare lucidity, after the creature's first murder, Frankenstein recognizes as much. I consider the being I had cast among mankind and endowed with the will of end power to affect purposes of horror, nearly in the light of my own vampire, my own spirit let loose from the grave and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. Here Shelley brilliantly depicts the creature as Frankenstein's double, an alter ego that embodies his essence. The creature's destructive rampage is just the other side of Frankenstein's self-destructive character. I am thy creature, the monster reminds his creator in a fateful scene, and as the murders proliferate and the corpses pile up, Frankenstein bemoans that he is condemned to carry about with me my eternal hell. What awaits Britain's rulers, the novel instructs, is a never-ending hell of conflict, violence, and death. The inevitable byproducts of the split society of which the Luddite uprisings were merely a premonition. The laboring masses would soon, Shelley cautioned, seethe for bloody revenge. As the creature warns Frankenstein, are you to be happy while I grovel in the intensity of my wretchedness? You can blast my other passions, but revenge remains. I may die, but first you, my tyrant and tormentor, shall curse the sun that gazes on your misery. 
Beware, for I am fearless and therefore powerful. Yet Victor Frankenstein, like Britain's rulers, seems incapable of heeding these warnings. But even as he appears driven by fate to run toward his doom in his reckless, vengeful pursuit of his monster, Mary Shelley lets it be known that other outcomes are possible. She does so by letting the creature speak. This is a move that deserves the closest attention. After all, contrary to most film versions in which the creature is typically a mute brute, Shelley portrays himself as an intelligent being with linguistic capacities. This decision highlights the monster's humanity and radically demarcates him from zombies. Indeed, in one of the most celebrated film versions, the most famous Hollywood actor to play the creature, Boris Karloff, deliberately zombified him. Karloff gave the creature the shuffling gait we associate with zombies and, and vigorously opposed letting the monster, monster speak. If he spoke, he would seem more human, he protested. Yet this is precisely Shelley's intent. As grotesque and horrifying as the creature might be, his capacity for speech is a fundamental marker of his humanity. Of the fact that proletarians are intelligent and articulate members of humankind, i.e. not zombies. Indeed, conferring speech on the, creature, on the creature is essential to the central hinge of the novel, a lengthy speech in which the monster narrates his life experience and stakes his claim for justice. The decision to give the monster an articulate voice is Mary Shelley's most important subversion of the category of monstrosity, when commentator rightly notes. Yet it is not just the capacity for language that subverts, but the actual content of the decisive speech in which the creature sets forth a radical analysis of its own plight. Echoing Payne and Godwin, the creature's oral treaties constitutes a veritable declaration of the rights of monsters. Hear my tale, the monster exclaims. And for six chapters that, comp that comprise over 20% of the text, we do just that. Abandoned by Frankenstein, I was a poor, helpless, miserable wretch. The creature explains, in order, to in order to procure the means of survival, his first acts involved searching for drink, warmth, food, and shelter, settling into a hovel adjacent to the cottage of a poor rural family, the De Lacy's. He observes their loves and labors. Desirous of helping them, the monster works at night in order to provide the family with food and fuel, left surreptitiously under cover of darkness. Here, Mary Shelley offers her own radical economics. While mainstream political economy emphasized the magic of the market, regulated by Adam Smith's famous invisible hand, Shelley foregrounds the invisible labors that sustained economic life. She delineates the surplus labor, work above and beyond that required for his own subsistence, through which the creature aids his neighbors. In what can only have been a deliberate reply to bourgeois economics, she parodies Adam Smith's metaphor in having the monster explain. I afterwards found that these labors performed by an invisible hand greatly astonished the Delisis. This striking formulation materializes the unseen labor of the invisible hands that sustain the capitalist economy, thereby enacting a critique of political economy from the standpoint of labor, one that rehearses Byron's insistence in his maiden speech that it is the reviled mob that labor in your field serve in your houses. But in addition to sustaining society through its work, these laboring monsters are also rational, communicative beings. Observing the family, the creature teaches himself to speak and to read, yet more evidence that he is not a mindless zombie. He finds and studies works by Plutarch, Milton, and Goethe, but his political education is most decisively formed by overhearing the text of a classic of the radical left. C.F. Volney's Ruins of Empire, read with commentary by the young man of the family to his lover, 
a Christianized Arab feminist, whose presence and life story raise interesting anti-colonial themes in the text. Mary Shelley's choice of Volney's ruins represents an inspired political statement. Long a favorite of her husband, ruins was a staple of the revolutionary movement. Published in France in 1791, just as the revolution was intensifying, it was translated quickly into English and German. The book was embraced by radical organizations like the London Corresponding Society and the United Irishmen, and was even found in Brazil in the possession of a mulatto engaged in a multiracial conspiracy. Volney was a determined critic of the patriarchal family, an opponent of slavery, whose abolition he voted for in the Revolutionary Assembly in France, and a proponent of the anti-Eurocentric view that human civilization, along with the arts and the sciences, originated in Africa. He was also an unrelenting opponent of private property, exploitation, and class inequality. The slavery of individuals derived, he argued, from the abusive right of property, which in turn produced an intestine war in which the citizens divided into contending corps core, of order, classes, families, unremittingly struggled to appropriate to themselves, under the name of supreme power, the ability to plunder everything. Society was thus divided into a group of wealthy drones and a multitude of mercenary poor, and these two classes, essentially opposite and hostile, entered into a recurring contest of the sort Mary Shelley depicts in Frankenstein. Volney too portrayed the ruling class as rushing to its own destruction. The day approaches when this colossus of power shall be crushed and crumbled under its own mass. The Creature's Enlightenment via Volney is a case study in radical education. Hearing ruins recited, he recounts, he wept over the destruction of the Aboriginal peoples of the Americas and heard of the division of property, of immense wealth, and squalid poverty. He learned that the individual is valued according to descent united with riches, i.e. according to everything the creature lacks. And what was I? I knew that I possessed no money, no friends, no kind of property. Was I then a monster, a blot upon the earth, from which all men fled, and whom all men disowned? A being without kin, friends, property, or wealth, the monster represents the negation of bourgeois distinction. He is the inhuman human, a violation of the social order who is nonetheless its product. He is capitalist society's dirty secret, one it must disavow in order to legitimate itself in its own eyes. The monster's very being is thus an offense to bourgeois sensibility, and for this simple ontological fact, not for anything he has done, he must be destroyed. Rejected by society, and most painfully by his creator, the monster declares war in Frankenstein and the social order he represents. In so doing, he undertakes conscious action of the sort that would be impossible for zombies. He begins by turning on the de Lacy family, who appropriated the products of its surplus labor. <clears throat> only to violently reject his approaches. By using the classic weapon of Promethean and plebeian insurgency, fire, I lighten the dry branch of a tree and dance with fury around the devoted cottage. With a loud scream, I fire the straw and heath and bushes I had collected, and the cottage was quickly enveloped by the flames. <clears throat> I noted above the use of fire as a tool of revolt by the rebellious crowd, which set, up, set parts of London ablaze during the Gordon riots, and by Luddite protesters who torched the houses of manufacturers. Such associations would have been obvious to many of Mary Shelley's early 19th century readers, for whom fire, that Promethean force, was a time-honored weapon of radical insurgency. Pausing on the road of murderous revenge, the creature searches out Frankenstein in hopes of averting further violence. What he needs, he urges, is for his creator to make him a female companion. Significantly, this demand for an elementary social relationship, a pair bond, is preferred in the language of Panetti radicalism. 
or painite radicalism. I demand it, I demand it of you as a right. At the same time, it is couched as a plea for recognition as a fellow being. Let me see that I excite the sympathy of some existing thing. Do, do not deny me my request. Shelley here emerges the assertion of rights with an appeal for recognition. Proletarian rebellion, she intimates, is fundamentally about the desire for recognition as equals, as full-fledged members of human society. In rebuffing demands for equal recognition, the ruling class instructs the oppressed that they are inferior, substandard members of a monstrous race. Indeed, it is in these terms that Frankenstein, having acceded to the creature's demand and commenced work on a partner for him, subsequently reneges. Reflecting that the monstrous couple might propagate, he is horrified at the prospect that a race of devils could be unleashed on humankind. Trembling with passion, he informs the reader, I tore to pieces the thing on which I was engaged. In this pivotal scene, Shelley insightfully weaves together themes of gender, class, and racial hatred. Frankenstein rehearses a powerful fear of females and their control of biological, as opposed to artificial, reproduction, consistent with his own withdrawal from women. At the same time, he enacts a venomous hostility towards the grotesque, grotesque people of the body who, who perform the world's invisible labors. It is worth recalling in this regard that the original English meaning of proletariat refers to those whose only function is to produce children. The term thus carries a double resonance, degrading the female labor of biological reproduction while also abasing the lives of all who are defined by physical toil. Construing proletarian monsters as a race of devils, of dangerous hyper-embodied beings, Frankenstein resorts to the ruling class's favored means of punishment, dissection, by tearing the half-finished female creature to pieces. And the creature responds in kind. He produces a string of corpses, the basic element of the anatomist's work, as if to incessantly remind Frankenstein of the barbaric dissections of which he is guilty, the bodies of those he dismembered to produce his monster, the severed corpse of the unfinished female, the dissection of the creature from all social bonds and connections. In becoming a provider of corpses, the creature mimics Frankenstein's profession, but with a dialectical inversion. <clears throat> Rather than plebeian corpses, the bodies he snatches come from the anatomist's own family and social class. This is one of many doublings that occur throughout the novel as each of the protagonists assumes a role. Pursuer, mourner, anatomist, murderer, previously occupied by the other. These reversals open onto a remarkably insightful passage in which Frankenstein reflects on the horrible irony of working class freedom in modern society. Hoping to kill the creature, he first remarks, If he were vanquished, I would be a free man. Yet trapped as he is in the cycle of destruction, the paradox of his statement immediately strikes him. Alas, what freedom, such as the peasant enjoys when his family has been massacred before his eyes, his cottage burnt, his lands laid waste, and he is turned adrift, homeless, penniless, and alone, but free? In the course of, ref of reflecting on the charade of freedom, for one who has suffered dispossession and loss, Frankenstein perceives the irony of liberty for the proletariat to be, like the creature, homeless, penniless, and alone. And it is this, Mary Shelley warns, the denial of social connection and belonging to the poor, which will rebound on the ruling class. The rage of the proletariat will ultimately consume everything, families and properties, in an inferno of riot and and revenge, reducing all to the same pitiful state. In this vein, the book ends on the linked deaths of its doubled protagonists. A dying Frankenstein, rescued at sea, recounts his tale to Captain Walton, while the creature, apprised of the death of his creator, announces that he will now take his own life <coughs> by lighting himself on fire in an act of inverted Prometheanism. On this note of mutual death and destruction, the novel ends, though with a certain ambiguity as to whether the creature has died or merely disappeared. 
And yet, a crucial scene precedes the novel's denouement and offers a potential escape from the cycle of death and destruction. Bellying the claim that Frankenstein is purged of reference to collective movements, Mary Shelley stages a, sailor, a sailor's rebellion that averts a terrible calamity. As Captain Walton pushes ever further toward the North Pole with the dying Frankenstein aboard, his crew grows increasingly alarmed by the dangerous polar ice the ship is encountering and by the extreme cold which has already cost several lives. Convinced that disaster lurks in further pursuing the voyage, the sailors threaten a mutiny, and they do so in profoundly democratic style, electing a deputation to demand that Walton turn back. Reluctantly and with great bitterness, Walton consents. Unlike Victor Frankenstein, who failed to turn back from his voyage to disaster, Walton is compelled by collective action to change direction, thereby forestalling catastrophe. In sketching this scene, Shelley drew upon a rich tradition of, of popular rebellion among sailors. Subjected to some of the harshest forms of capitalist discipline aboard floating factories, sailors built a potent culture of resistance that included strikes, work stoppages, and structures of countervailing authority to that of the captain. When on land, they were among the most rebellious elements of the urban mob. Their most sustained confrontations at sea took the form of mutiny, an outright seizure of the ship and its command. And when they did take control of a ship, they typically administered it according to markedly democratic and egalitarian norms. Mary Shelley's portrayal of the collective power of sailors curtailing the reckless autocracy of a master was both credible and for ruling classes who feared plebeian mutinies ominous. Yet, consistent with her Godwinian liberalism, she does not conjure up a sailor's rebellion to preach revolution, but rather to recommend a new class compromise in which the voices of the downtrodden are heeded rather than ignored. To be sure, Godwinian liberalism was distinguished by its powerful critique of the prevailing system of property and power in British society. By attacking property relations, the Godwin Wollstonecraft School departed decisively from mainstream, main, mainstream liberalism, making tentative contact with plebeian radicalism. But in disowning collective movements in favor of individual writing and educative work, it took up a decidedly middle class posture at odds with the radical workers movement. The political outlook inherited by Mary Shelley was thus an anxious radical liberalism. And this brings us to Mary Shelley's own horror over the mob. An 1817 letter to her, to her husband epitomizes this attitude. Commenting on a recent newsletter by the reformer William Cobbett, she, excla she exclaims, He appears to be making out a list for a prescription. I actually shudder to read it. A revolution in this country would not be so bloodless if that man has any power in it. I fear he is a bad man. He encourages the multitude, the worst possible human passion, revenge. Revenge, of course, is precisely what fuels the monster's murder spree in Frankenstein. The creature, too, makes Shelley anxious, and this allows her to tap into similar anxieties among her readers. Dedicated as she is to social reform, the urgency of which she hopes to persuade her readers she deeply fears rebellion from below. Like her father, hers are a politics of enlightened gradualism driven by publicly spirited members of the middle class intent on mediating between the rulers and the mob. Discussing the oppression of the Italian people by, by, Austrian, by Austria in the 1840s, for instance, she declares her sympathies with the subjugated while similarly counseling against revolt. Peaceful mediation and a strong universal sense of justice are to be enlisted instead of the cannon and the bayonet, she advises. Mary Shelley largely shared this political stance with her husband, albeit with some qualifications. While the young Percy Shelley had undertaken political agitation, particularly among the Irish, his idol, William Godwin, sharply condemned such activism. Urging his pupil to eschew agitation, 
Godwin wrote that discussion, reading, inquiry, perpetual communication were his favorite methods. But associations, organized societies, I firmly condemn, he declared. Shelley soon capitulated, announcing his conversion to Godwin's position. Never again, never again was he to engage in political activism. Yet, uncertain about the political efficacy of merely writing on behalf of reform, he regularly flirted with the idea that a great social upheaval might be necessary to change society. Never were these flirtations more serious than in 1819, the year after his wife published Frankenstein, when he explicitly reopened the question of insurrection, insurrectionary politics. The impetus for this was the massacre on August 16, 1819 of peaceful working class demonstrators at St. Peter's Field in Manchester. The huge demonstration of up to 120,000 people was called to demand electoral reform, particularly so that Manchester might have its own member or members of parliament. Just as the first speaker commenced his oratory, mounted soldiers attacked the crowd. Leading the assault were the Yeomen, the Manchester manufacturers, merchants, pu uh, publicans, and shopkeepers on horseback, who struck with a vengeance, killing 11, among them a child, and wounding over 400 others. Peter Lou, as the massacre was soon dubbed, provoked massive popular indignation. <clears throat> Amidst the outrage, Percy Shelley quickly penned The Mask of Anarchy, a seething response hailed as the greatest poem of political protest ever written in English. More than this, however, Shelley determined to sort through the problem of political reform in the face of such class violence. To this end, he labored over an essay, A Philosophical View of Reform, which, after commencing on a remarkably timid footing, turns to the question of revolution. If the opening sections explore the prospects for peaceful, incremental change, a shift occurs halfway through the essay as he finally confronts the fundamental question raised by Peter Liu, how to pursue social progress if the British autocracy violently resists all campaigns for reform. Let us hope, he writes, that faced with peaceful mass protest, the oppressors would feel their impotence and grant reforms. If, however, they find civil war preferable to resigning any portion, however small of their usurped authority, he asserts, we possess a right of resistance. More than this, the last resort of resistance is undoubtedly insurrection. Unlike some theorists of the right of revolution, such as John Locke, Shelley imagines that it is the mass of the oppressed, indeed of the working class, who possess this right of insurrection, not merely a coterie of a propertied gentleman. Any doubts on this score and dispelled by a reading of his great poem Any doubts on this score are dispelled by a reading of his great poem, Prometheus Unbound, whose composition overlaps with that of a philosophical view. The poem begins with the bondage of Prometheus, bound to a rock by order of Jupiter. Prometheus's lover, Asia, and her sister, Panthea, set out to liberate the confined god. To succeed, however, they must first make contact, contact with the murky figure, Demogorgon, who resides in a cave. The identity of Demogorgon has mystified many critics, but this is more a political failing than a strictly literary one having to do with a refusal to acknowledge the radicalism that animated Shelley's writings. Demogorgon is initially described as a tremendous gloom and later as a mighty darkness. In Act 3, Jupiter denounces this creature as his detested prodigy, echoing the terms in which Frankenstein describes his monster. Another set of clues is provided when, in seeking commune with Dem Demogorgon, Asia and Panthea hear the song of the spirits which repeatedly urges them to go down, down, in order to unloose through life's portal the snake-like doom coiled underneath the throne of Jupiter. Demogorgon is thus a dark, immensely powerful, but still unformed being, the rejected offspring of Jupiter, who resides below the Earth's surface. It takes little imagination to recognize 
to recognize him as precisely what the Greek origin of his name suggests, Demos Gorgon, the people monster. It is especially significant in this regard that an influential radical newspaper of the day with which Shelley may have been familiar was called the Gorgon. Moreover, this publication was not alone in identifying the radical cause with ruling class images of the monstrous rabble. In Greek legend, the Gorgons consisted of three grotesque females, only one of whom, Medusa, could see, albeit through just one eye. Tellingly, another radical broadsheet took the name Medusa. In invoking proletarian monstrosity in Prometheus Unbound, Percy Shelley thus improvised on a contemporary radical trope, one which also figures in Frankenstein. The difference here is that the monster's awakening is potentially regener regenerative of society, rather than merely destructive. But, but because Demogorgon is not fully formed, Asia undertakes to educate him, specifically to free him from the spell of religion. Once enlightened, he is ready to assume his revolutionary mission. What follows in Act 3, Scene 1, is nothing less than an insurrectionary uprising, as Demogorgon dethrones Jupiter and propels him into the underworld. One of the more astute commentators on this poem notes that Shelley models this upheaval on the dramatic image of a volcanic eruption, a dispute which eclipses the sun and shakes the planets, possibly even the Milky Way. He notes can only imply a revolutionary insurgency. And once the tyrant is banished by force, Shelley depicts a world transformed. The loathsome mask has fallen, the man remains spectreless, free, uncircumscribed. But man, equal, unclassed, tribeless, and nationless, exempt from awe, worship, degree, the king over himself. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein does not offer us, except perhaps in its description of the sailor's revolt, prospects for a better world. But by figuring the creation of the proletariat in the idioms of grave robbing and anatomy, it secured its place as, among other things, one of the great political psychological portrayals of the monstrosities of the market. In so doing, it subtly deciphered the horrors of the lectures read upon working class bodies and minds by nascent capitalism. It was during this period, after all, that working people were increasingly described in terms of body part hands. Indeed, the very language of the day often further reduced these hands to physical extensions of the means of production, variously denoting them as farm hands, dock hands, machine hands, deck hands. In the latter case, that of sailors. When referred to collectively, they became a mammoth agglomeration of detached parts, summoned with the cry, all hands on deck. The dominant ideology both reified working people in this way, reducing them to abstracted body parts, while denying their significance in the creation of wealth in society. In a classic process of mystification, the driving force of capitalism was detached from the actual hands of labor and attributed to the invisible hand of the market. By returning capitalism to the realities of the grotesque laboring body, Frankenstein foregrounded the processes of social anatomization by which people became hands and through which the invisible hands of labor simultaneously generated the wealth of the ruling class. Despite this critical thrust, however, and despite rendering the proletarian monster as intelligent and articulate as something other than a zombie, Mary Shelley too recoiled from the ugliness of the proletarian monster that capitalism had created. But working class radicals, among them those who supported papers like Gorgon and Medusa, were already affirming proletarian monstrosity. In so doing, they shifted, shifted the dialectic of monstrosity in a direction that would be claimed by Marx.